sitting here with the tiniest bit of time on my hands, sleeping baby in my arms and toddler asleep upstairs. So I thought it would be as good a time as any to sit down and chat a little bit about the third stage of labour and birth. So that is from the delivery of your placenta to those first few moments up to the first hour, we like to call the golden hour, with your baby up on your chest, ideally, if all is going well. So it's um, one of the phases that a lot of people don't give heaps of thought to. Generally, it's about you know preparing for those birth surges, how labour is going to begin. And then we talk a lot about the things that you need once baby's actually born, when in actual fact, they don't need a whole lot. Um, spoiler alert. But when it comes to delivery of the placenta, which is an organ that is grown specifically for the purpose of supporting and nourishing and delivering all of those important nutrients to your baby and that lovely oxygenated blood flow through the cord. So what happens when baby's first delivered um, is that generally that cord is still pulsating, so still sending all of that oxygen-rich blood supply to your baby. And when it comes to creating kind of preferences around the birth of your placenta, majority of us, whether or not you are resus negative or positive, can allow for at least some degree of pulsating of the cord for more of that blood to flow to baby. There's lots of different benefits to this um, and as an overall sort of overarching theme, it's that those babies who have that extra little bit of blood tend to have more stable um, hemoglobin levels, which is of course the uh, iron component within the red blood cells, but equally they tend to kind of thrive and do a little bit better and have better outcomes in terms of their transition to extra uterine life, so that's life outside the womb. Um, equally, that time when your baby comes up to you, up onto your chest, skin to skin, does a lot of wonderful things. So if your baby doesn't require immediate medical attention, there's no need for them to be taken away from you at all. All of those checks where they are looking at, you know, the, the frontal and um, but these two soft spots here, the fontanelles, can be done while baby's on your chest. They can count fingers and toes. They can check, check the baby's got a complete palate and no teeth. You can check for a patent anus. All of those lovely little checks can be done while baby's up on your chest. The only one that can't be done there is when your baby needs to be weighed. In which case, from a lactation consultancy perspective, I would say wait until that first big poo because of course that can massively throw off um, what the real birth weight looks like um, and as a result can throw off how much baby or how much weight your baby then goes to lose and can cause unnecessary concern over weight loss um, where maybe it was never a huge concern in the beginning. So waiting for the first poo, doing delayed checks, if your baby is pinking up beautifully and has great tone and indeed for that first little while has that lovely flow of fresh placental blood flow coming to them, the chances are they don't need to be whisked away nor do those checks need to be done as in a case of urgency. When your baby's up skin to skin, some of the benefits of that, so not only is it great for snuggles and just getting to know one another, but it also releases hormones both in mum and in baby that help get breastfeeding off to a great start. It helps to regulate baby's heart rate, their temperature and their blood sugar level. It also helps to diversify their microbiome. One of the other things that you might like to do, add to your birth preferences list for that third stage, is to leave your baby's hands well alone. So to, while they might require a little bit of stimulation just to get them to kind of realise they're outside and give a nice big cry perhaps, leaving their hands covered in that amniotic fluid has that lovely smell that helps them to aim for the areola, which of course is releasing um, lubricating fluid from the Montgomery glands, those little dots you might notice around the darker part of your nipple that smell the same as the um, fluid that they've been swimming in for the last nine months or more. So they use that almost like a GPS system to help them find the breast. So leaving the, the fluid on the amniotic fluid all over their hands helps them to kind of go between their hands and finding the breast. You might also have noticed that your nipple and areola have darkened in pregnancy. And since babies don't have, they generally see sort of in shadow in the first while. So it's quite darkened um, sense of vision. They can see the darkening and that kind of have the bullseye of where to go for. When it comes to delivery of the placenta, most hospital policy allows or would like the delivery of the placenta to happen within the first 20 minutes after birth. 
it doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes it can take a little bit longer. In fact, the World Health Organization um, allow for up to four hours for delivery once mum's bleeding is okay. Of course, what can happen is as your if your placenta is still intact, so it's still adhered to or sort of um, stuck to the inside lining of your uterine wall, what happens is it stops your uterus from clamping down. And as a result, it means you can have a risk of more bleeding. In a you know in terms of your decisions around delivery of the placenta you can if you've had no other interventions like that if you've gone on to have a normal intervention free physiological birth without things like an epidural ideally without a really long labor and um, without twins on board without all of that stuff you can go on to deliver the placenta yourself Things that can help your placenta come away is putting baby to the breast, which of course stimulates your uterus to contract, just in the same way that nipple stimulation can bring on labour in some cases. Um, equally, emptying your bladder so you've got plenty of room for the placenta to move down and for your uterus to contract right down. Getting into a squatting position so that gravity is working in your favour can also be really helpful. If you have other risk factors like you've had a previous um, PPH or a large bleed, if you have twins on board, had a really long labour, have required some sort of intervention during your during your, the birth of your baby, so oxytocin, if you've had an epidural on board, all of these things would put you at higher risk for having a little bleed after delivery. So in that case, they like to get the placenta out fairly swiftly with a little bit of, of traction on the cord, paired with an injection into the side of your thigh. There's two major injections that are used or uh, sort of, uh, medications that are used in Ireland. The first most common one is a combination of ergometrin and um, oxytocin, synthetic oxytocin, and that combination helps to clamp the uterus down nice nice and tightly and helps the, the placenta come away from the wall so it generally comes reasonably quickly and um, within the first 20 minutes or so the other option is to go for just 10 international units of the oxytocin itself and the nice thing about that is it's less likely to have that kind of pukey nausea nausea inducing um, symptom of the ergometrin that is in the other component or that other mixture so you might want to request that as a part of your, your birth preferences. Um, they are the major ones. Um, asking for plenty of assistance to get breastfeeding off to a good start if that's what your plan is or using a paste bottle feeding technique if you are formula feeding. Daddy or your partner can do lots of skin to skin as well. Lots of lovely benefits there. And asking for what we call the golden hour. So the likelihood, the, the lovely thing about that as well as getting to know your baby um, and getting to know your baby's feeding cues and things like that is that babies come out excited and energetic and ready to feed. And that first hour, you want to make sure to make the most out of that so it can help your breastfeeding journey get off to a really good start if your baby has their first feed ideally within the first hour after birth because after that they get a really nice sleepy period where they're kind of having a little bit of a breather after that big journey going from inside to the outside world um, they're all the big things that I can think of at the moment. After after that, what you want to do with your placenta is very much up to you. In most hospital scenarios, it will just be whisked away and um, taken to to be disposed of correctly um, in the medical waste. Um, if you want to do things you might want to do with it yourself so you can make prints of it you can take pictures of it you can get a little tour of it to so get your midwife to show you around the placenta where your baby's little home has been for the last nine months um, some people want to take it away with them and maybe plant it under a nice tree and create some ceremony around the placenta it's we actually did absolutely nothing with Atticus's. And then with Archer's, we buried it under a nice little rose bush in our garden and Atticus helped us do that. It was kind of a nice way to honour it in some way. Nice thing to do. You can also donate it to the, um, the dog rescue. So the search and rescue sometimes use the human placentas for their trip doggies in training, which is nice. And they weren't actually accepting them the last two years, I don't think, but it's worthwhile contacting them anyway. And the other thing that some people do do is they ingest it from a lactation consultancy perspective. I don't generally recommend that because that sort of when we're really re what we're really relying on for that kind of second phase of lactogenesis, our milk transitioning in is a drop in our progesterone, which relies on the the um, placenta coming away in its completion. And if we don't get that, sometimes our milk can be hindered from coming in well and properly and in good timing. So 
in that case, if you were ingesting it and kind of constantly drip feeding the progesterone back in where we would like to see and ordinarily a drop in progesterone and a peak in the a surge in the prolactin, that's the milk making hormone. If you're constantly drip feeding back that progesterone, it, it's likely to have implications on your milk supply. Um, equally, you can't donate milk if you have to have ingested your placenta and some practitioners um, aren't you know, fully food tested, food safety tested, and aren't likely to test for things like GBS screening. So um, always worthwhile keeping in mind if that's something that you feel is the right decision for you and your family. And um, just to make sure you're making a really well, you know, well, well, well researched decision for you. Um, and that's everything that I can think of. If you did anything particularly nice with your placenta, or you had a particularly lovely um, third stage do let me know and um, I'll try and maybe insert some pictures of me delivering my own placenta and having a good look at it it was it's a really um nice part if you give plenty of time to it and not something that many couples tend to tend to plan much for so I hope this has kind of incited some degree of curiosity for you and I will see you in the next video